Last couple of weeks, we have looked at some issues that are really relevant to all human beings. And it's, you know, where is God in the midst of the pain and the suffering? And why, why does he allow? It was kind of like the first week as we talked about Jesus allowing Lazarus to die and rising him from the dead. And, you know, we saw that suffering is inevitable. We all experience it. But we also have a God who, who isn't just standing by watching us suffer. We have a God who chose to suffer and chose to die for us so that as we suffer, he is suffering alongside us. And so it was kind of a, a, really, a really cool story that we were able to talk about. And then last week we got to talk about my, probably one of my top five favorite stories in all of the Bible, the story of Esther. And um, you know how God can take something that looks so bad, I mean terrible, and he can bring beauty and goodness out of this wretched situation. I mean, what's really cool is that sometimes he takes <clears throat> these bad situations and he, he brings good and beauty out of it that could have never happened had we not walked through the suffering. And so it's just really cool stories um, and these topics affect all of us. If you weren't here the last two weeks and you're interested in those, I would encourage you to go to our website and uh, grab those because they're there. Uh, but so I had another message planned for this week. And then as I was, as I was thinking, um, I realized there's, there's one thing that we didn't talk about on this topic. You know, every week we uh, were looking kind of at an overview passage, Romans 8, 28. And um, it says, and we know that in all things, God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance. And he chose them to become like his son. So, I mean, you see, pain and suffering are inevitable. We all experience it. There is going to be a day, praise the Lord, where God will wipe away every tear from our eye. He will eliminate pain and suffering for good. Amen. But until that day, he keeps working in all things, the good, the bad, the ugly, the pretty. He works in all things to create good and to make us the, the last line, more like Jesus. We become more like his son. So I think it'd be really beneficial if we looked at a couple of verses today, the ones that actually follow this passage, the next ones. Now, I owe you an apology because the one thing that I have lied to you about is that we are in an, a series called Unexpected Stories, and today is not a story. I know, mutual, oh man, we love these stories. <laughs> Uh, but I think it's going to be good. Thank you. You know, when you have to ask for something, like, you know, an applause, it's like a mercy clap. That was a mercy awe. It's okay, though. <clears throat> so we're going to address today about how we respond in the midst of suffering. So are you okay with that? All right. Well, let me begin with a question. Raise your hand if you, in the last month, have felt overwhelmed at some point. Yeah, I mean, see... This is so relevant. You know, you have three kids that need to be at three different places at the same time. Overwhelmed. Or you have this big presentation at work and one of your kids throws up on you in the car. <laughs> I mean, it, it happens. Um, you ran out of money and you have nine days left of the month. Or, or everybody is expecting something from you and you just don't have anything left to give. You ever been there? Sometimes, though, it's the big things. It's, you know, diagnosis of cancer, a layoff, a spouse leaves, somebody you love dies. I mean, we have these things, and no matter how much we think we've got our life handled, stuff happens, and we realize we are out of control. We are overwhelmed. It's, it's so funny. You know, every time I I've said this to you before, I am preparing a message and God is using exact, that message for me. And so I realized that you just get to hear the message that God had for me. And that's what happened again. I'm in my final two weeks of PhD courses. I mean, August 14th, I am done with all classes. My wife says, praise the Lord. She does. Yeah. You're, they're clapping for you, sweetie. I know. <laughs> but... Everything is due in the next two weeks, and um, summers are always the worst because it's kind of like a shortened schedule, and my family has been so generous. Rather than going back to Sun Prairie, I've, this will be, you know, uh, I stayed here all of last 
week before, working on papers and stuff. And they're letting me do it again this week. So I am feeling that overwhelming sense, you know, that I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. And then all of a sudden, I'm looking at a passage of Scripture, and you can see kind of the title where it talks about us overcoming. And you're like, what in the world, Lord? I am drowning. How am I supposed to stand before these lovely people and talk about overcoming and handling difficulty? And once again, God reminds me, uh, Don, overcoming has nothing to do with you anyway. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> Making good, he says, is my job. It's not your responsibility to make good out of all of the bad stuff in your life. So, Don, you keep looking towards me, and I'll take care of it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm broken. I'm a mess. I need God to work in me. I still need Jesus to work in me every day of my life. And so do you. We cannot do it. We can't overcome on our own. It's impossible. But see, the cool thing is God has some really, really good news for us. Because what's ever going on in your life, whatever seems so big that you can't handle it, if you have chosen to follow Jesus, you already are an overcomer. You are right now an overcomer. It's not that you're going to finally overcome when you get to heaven. No. No. You're an overcomer right now. Now, some of you are already checking out on me because you're like, that sounds like self-help junk, you know, guru stuff. And you're an overcomer. Of course, you don't feel this way. We don't. We feel like a mess. We feel broken. We feel overwhelmed. You, you might not even think this way, that I'm an overcomer. But I promise you, this isn't a self-help maneuver. The reason you already are an, overcoming, uh, an overcomer is because overcoming is not about you. It's about Jesus. So today we're going to really look at a portion of Scripture that is so rich. Probably, arguably, one of the most powerful chapters in the Bible. We're not going to look at the whole chapter. But if you have a Bible, you're going to want to bookmark Romans 8. Because that's where we're going to be today. Now let me give you a little bit of background. Romans is a book that the Apostle Paul wrote with the intent of changing how we think changing how that original audience thought, that church in Rome. Now, a good overview for the book is uh, in Romans 12. We're not going to be here all day, but I wanted you to see, this is kind of like a big picture overview of the book. Do not conform yourself to the pattern of this world. You know, like the pattern of this world being, um, if I can purchase enough stuff, I'll be happy. Or if I just work hard, um, I will be satisfied. If I finally get the house, I, I open my own business, I finally have a kid or find the right person to marry, then I finally will be satisfied. Those kinds of things. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, because we all know if we think about it, they don't work. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's all about the way we think. So that's kind of the overview of the book of Romans. And I'm going to mention this verse several times throughout because it has a lot to do with Romans 8. So um, you can look, at, I wanted to show you a map real quick because the Apostle Paul, the guy who wrote Romans, um, he was a Jewish Pharisee who grew up in Tarsus. And you can kind of see Tarsus on the map. It's about 500 miles from Jerusalem. So <clears throat> because of his location, Paul was a student of both Roman literature and, and Greek literature and Jewish literature. So this made him the perfect person to be called the apostle to the Gentiles, to take Christianity out of the Jewish world into the Gentile world. Because he knew both sides very well. And before writing the book of Romans, he had been a follower of Christ for about 25 years. And he had already gone around starting churches and helping those churches grow um, and, and fight heresy and all of this stuff. He was already very, very um, accomplished at growing these churches and writing letters to encourage them and all of that. And in those 25 years, Christianity had spread from Jerusalem to little pockets all over the Roman Empire, which you can see kind of in the dark orange there. Um, Christianity had spread to pockets all over that. Within 200 years, that whole area would be covered um, by, by churches. But 
about 25 years into Christianity, it, there were little pockets everywhere. It was really cool to see, if you could see that map. Sorry, I didn't bring that one. And um, before he wrote to the Christians in Rome, though, this is what's interesting. Something really strange happened in Rome. See, like most churches that had been started, the church at Rome was made up of both Jews and Gentiles worshiping together. But because the Jews were more familiar with the Hebrew Scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, they usually ended up being the leaders in the churches because they knew the scriptures, they kind of had the background, and it just, you know, they kind of rose to the top in all of these different churches that, um, you know, where they were leaders. And so a couple of decades into Christianity, the Roman emperor at the time, his name was Claudius, he did something that was really bizarre. He issued an edict that required every Jewish person in Rome to get out. They'd been stirring up some trouble and said he wanted to end it. And so he was like, all Jews have to get out of Rome. And that included the Jewish Christians. So overnight, the Jews in the, in the city of Rome lost everything. They had to leave. They had to get out. And they would go out into you know, the, the many other cities all around Rome. And overnight, the church in Rome lost all of its leaders, 100%. And so the church became, I mean, like in an instant, became completely Gentile. The Gentiles had to take over everything, the preaching, the teaching, the discipling, men's ministry, women's ministry. I'm just kidding. They didn't have those. But all of this stuff, they had to take it over. A couple of years went by. Finally, the Jews are allowed to come back to Rome. Now, when they did, the Jewish leaders, the former leaders, kind of expected to be able to go back into their normal roles, except the Gentiles were now leaders, and they had been for a couple of years, and they were kind of comfortable. They liked leading. So you can imagine, tensions started rising. There was some infighting. Some of the leaders even became arrogant, which just is amazing to think that church leaders could become arrogant. Oh, never. The sad thing is we're laughing because we know how untrue that is. That happens all the time. So you have all of this tension and and arrogance and, and Jews looking at Gentiles as lesser and Gentiles looking at Jews as lesser. And that's when Paul wrote Romans. He writes in the middle of this situation. And it's a book that's about uniting Jews and Gentiles, helping them to think differently, that they are no longer Jews and Gentiles, but they are one body in Christ. They are united. And in Romans, Paul gives us some of the most powerful words about unity and what it means to follow Jesus what it means to overcome difficulty because they had experienced a lot of difficulty when the Jews had to leave. And now they were experiencing a completely different kind of difficulty in trying to get back together. So that's kind of the background of where we are. So let's look at uh, Romans 8.31. And it just starts, what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? And, you know, without reading the whole chapter, just to kind of give you a real quick thing. What wonderful things is he talking about? Romans 8, 1, that if you are in Jesus, there is no condemnation. You get to come to Jesus just as you are. Prostitute, tax collector, Gentile. It didn't matter how messed up you were. In Christ, there is no condemnation. You get to come just how you are, and he will transform you. Powerful words. And then he talks about how the Holy Spirit is given to us. And we're not, we're not in this alone. We have the Spirit who lives inside of us. And then he talks about this future glory where there is going to be a day when all suffering is ended and all pain is gone and God does wipe away every tear from our eyes. There's this future glory. And in, but while we're here struggling, dealing with the pain and suffering, and these guys were dealing with persecution, while we're suffering... And even when we don't know how to pray, the Spirit is praying for us. God is praying for us. He is that much on our side. And not only that, in the midst of the pain and suffering, and this is the verse we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, Romans 8, 28 through 30, God works all things together for good. So in light of, this is what he's saying in verse 31, in light of all of this good stuff, He says, if God is for us, who could ever be against us? Who could be against us? I mean, God has, he's done it all. He's he's given us hope. He's given us promise. He said he'll never leave us. He'll always be with us. The Holy Spirit will live inside of us in all of this. If he's for us, who could be against us? 
That is good stuff. So when tragedy happens and we're diagnosed with cancer or somebody we love is, or we have that unexpected layoff, or the Roman emperor kicks us out of our own city, no matter how bad it gets, we have hope. Because if God is on our side and he is on our side, whatever happens, good or bad, Nothing owns us. Nothing controls our hope. Nothing controls our future because it's not in our hands or in the hands of anybody else. It is in God's hands only. So look at the next verse. He says, Since God did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? I mean, God became human so that he could suffer with us and die for us. If he is willing to do that, what would he hold back? nothing nothing so verse 33 he says who dares accuse us whom god has chosen for his own no one for god himself has given us right standing with himself he's like it doesn't matter who hates us and they had a lot of people who hated them it doesn't matter uh who the people who lie about us because that was happening a lot that the christians were being lied about in rome but we don't have to measure up to anybody else's standard our value Yes, Lord, I know this one's for me. Our value is not based on our performance. We are valuable. Why? Because God loves us and God accepts us because of what Jesus did. Period. Isn't that good stuff? All right, verse 34. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand. What's he doing? pleading for us. We are free. We are no longer condemned. And Jesus pleads our case. You feel like you don't measure up? Me too. You feel like you're not good enough? Me too. But stop thinking that way, Don, (laughs) because that's bad thinking. That's not good thinking because you can't measure up. Jesus did it for you. You don't have the power to measure up to the standard. And so Jesus said, no problem, I'll take it. I'll plead your case. I met the standard. It is all good. God considered us so worthy, he did not even spare his own son. So, church, wonderful people, you are not condemned. The price is paid. Christ has died for us, and he was raised back to life for us. So, stop worrying about your inadequacies. Stop worrying about all the stuff going on in your life. God knows about it. He's good. He says, live for me. Allow God to begin transforming your life in the midst of whatever you're dealing with. And we're all dealing with stuff. Some of us dealing with really bad stuff. Some of us, you know, the bad stuff was in the past and now it's just a little bad stuff. (sighs) But God wants, he's working in it. Verse 35. Can anything, and this is what we read earlier, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? I mean, bad stuff happening doesn't mean that God doesn't love us and it doesn't mean that God has forgotten us. Pain, it's a part of the world we live in. It's part. Following Jesus doesn't insulate us from the bad stuff. It just creates new problems, you know? I mean, following Jesus, it's like, yeah, you're going to probably have all the problems you had before, but we're going to add a couple of new ones. But, yeah, one day it's going to end. It will end one day. But in the meantime, for now, God promises to use all of those problems to grow us to be more like Jesus. Now, this is cheesy, and it does sound like a bumper sticker, but I don't care. I love it, all right? It's, It's kind of a motto for me. Pain doesn't define you doesn't define me. It refines you. It refines me. And I know, put that on your bumper sticker. Just if you make money, I want to cut. Um, (laughs) I would say that, but nobody buys bumper stickers anymore. So I get that. Pain doesn't define you. It refines you. We're not insulated from it. But we are promised that the pain is not the end. That God is growing us through the pain to become more and more like Jesus. But let's get to the really good stuff. Because from here on out, it gets so much better. Verse 37, no, despite all of these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Now, 
This is the NLT translation. The NLT tries to really help you understand what the Greek, the original language was, what the Greek kind of means in today's language. I love the NLT when I preach, and I love other versions like that that really try to help you understand what they're saying. But there is a version called the ESV that really tries to be a little bit more literal, and they try to, you know, kind of, they try to go more word for word. I love their translation of this verse. It says, no, in all of these things, you know, he's talking about trouble or calamity, persecution, hunger, threatened with death. In all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now, so you have all this stuff going on, and we are what? And you sounded like conquerors on that. That was just... <laughs> mm. Let's try it. Let's just try that one more time for me. Okay. We are what? That is exactly right. We are more than a conqueror. Are we more than conquerors? In in Christ. Exactly. That was awesome, though. Thank you. In him who loved us, in Christ. Now, this is the secret. Because see, many self-help books tell us if we just do this or that, everything will be okay. We will get success if we do A, B, and C. But that's bad thinking. It's bad thinking because there is no magic thing that you can do to fix it all. There's no magic formula to finally get success. It doesn't work that way. We do not have enough strength. We do not have enough power. We overcome through the power of the risen Christ. You don't have to, this is what's great. You don't have to do anything to be a conqueror, to be an overcomer. You don't. All you have to do is follow Jesus and he conquers. He is the conqueror. You already are a conqueror. You are, no, that was a lie. You are not a conqueror. You are more than a conqueror. You are more than an overcomer. Now, I said it a minute ago, the New Testament was written in Greek. And in that language, there is a little word called nikao. Nikao. Now, nikao means to conquer or to overcome. It's a word that means to win or be victorious. But that's not the word that's used in this verse. It's not. The word used in this passage is hooper nikao. Now, notice the first part of that word, hooper. We get our word hyper from the same root. It means exceedingly more than. Paul is, is saying, he's not just saying that we're overcomers. No, 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 no. We're way more. If nikao means to win, hooper nikao means to crush beyond recognition. (laughs) I've been practicing that. I was trying to sound manly. Mm. Had on my sports sports voice. We are more than conquerors through Jesus who loves us. You know, life might provide some really big bumps. But compared to the victory at the end, they're so small. Now, let me give you an illustration because I love football. I love it. I was born in Miami, Florida. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I am a Miami Dolphin fan through and through, and we know what it's like to be overwhelmed. We know what it's like to not overcome. I remember, you know, it's been like 20 years since we've been like, yeah, okay. If you're a Miami Dolphin fan, you are really a fan, all right? And so I remember this game, though, as a kid. We were playing our nemesis, the New York stinking Jets, all right? <laughs> and that's, I'm not kidding. If you're in Miami, that's what the Jets are called, the stinking Jets. They, there is no team called the Jets. It's the stinking Jets. Now, we're playing them, and in this game, our quarterback was sacked a couple of times. And there were some times where we went three and out and we just had to punt the ball. I even think in that game, if I remember correctly, there was an interception made. But at the end of the game, when you looked at the scoreboard, the Miami Dolphins won by 21 points. It was a huge victory. We didn't just overcome. We crushed them. Hooper Nakao, baby. (laughs) That's what happened. And what's funny is the sacks and the interception, when you were watching the game, they were freaking you out because you're like, you know, no, no, you know, just when we thought we had some momentum, no, and you just, I remember grandpa 
man, grandpa would just, he was the loudest dolphin watcher in the world. And, you know, it was kind of like, kids, close your ears because you're going to hear things that you're not allowed to hear. And that's what it was as you're watching this game and you're just seeing the frustration and all of the sacks and interception. But it's funny because the next day when you're watching ESPN and you see the speed bumps, you see the interception, you see the sacks, you've got a big smile on your face. Why? Because it's all about perspective. I knew what the score was at the end. See, there's pain now, but the, in the end, we're victorious. It's kind of like, you know, you can imagine Moses crossing the Red Sea with, with all of these, these former, I mean, like, been out of slavery for three days kind of thing. And they have the Red Sea. God parts the Red Sea. Everybody goes through with the, with, with the Egyptian army right on their tail trying to kill them. The Egyptian army tries to cross the same place that, that the Israelites crossed. And then, boom, overwhelming victory. The, the Israelites are saved. Hooper Nakao. See, in this world, we will have trouble. But we follow somebody who overcomes the world. To be an overcomer. Ah, think about this. We all, we all face struggles and trials. And of course we will, because to be an overcomer, by definition, you have to have something to overcome. I mean, just the fact that we're called overcomers means we're going to go through pain, because you can't overcome unless you go through pain. We are overcomers, not through our own power, but the power of the risen Christ. This, I mean, think about how this will blow you away. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead that same power lives inside of you and me. I mean, I can't raise somebody from the dead. The best doctors in the world might be able to revive somebody, but they still die. <laughs> I mean, the same power that rose Jesus from the dead permanently lives inside of you and me. So our job is not trying to overcome. It's to become more and more like Jesus, to, to learn to think and see the world through different eyes, to to be a Packer fan, I'll just, you know, I understand. But to be the Dolphin fan, watching ESPN the next day because we know we blew them away the day before. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Change the way that you look at life. Stop focusing on you. Be start focusing on God, loving him, and loving other people. Spend time reading his word. Learn how to pray. I, I mean, I could just tell you to pray. Honestly, it's hard sometimes. Spend some time learning how to pray. I would love to direct you if you have questions on that. Write that on your connection card. I will. That is a fun one for me. Make decisions in your life and in your job and in your family with God in mind. Lord, what do you want us to do? Serve your family. Love those who are against you. Don't seek to retaliate when people hurt you. Get to know your neighbor. Serve those in need. I mean, this is love God and love people and allow him to begin changing the way you think. Allow him to begin doing something in your heart that is transforming. How do you get there? You just love God and love people. And he begins to do the work in you. Learn to think differently because you already are an overcomer. Life might look helpless, but it's going to be okay because in the end, Hooper Nakao, baby. Hooper Nakao. More than conquerors. We will win gloriously. No matter what you're facing now, no matter how bad it seems, it will not destroy you. In the end, we win. So stop thinking like a victim. Stop being defined by your problems. I'm talking to me here. I'm glad you get to listen, but this Don, <laughs> the problems are real. And there's no doubt that your problems are real and my problems are real. They are, and they hurt, and they alter our lives. And sometimes our problems are so big, they take our lives. But even that's not the end. For nothing can overcome you, not even death. You are a child of God. Nothing can separate you from his love. And then let's look at the last two verses. The Apostle Paul says, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, not death or life, not angels or demons, not our fears for today, not our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. 
And then verse 39, no power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, God isn't surprised when we deal with the worst situations that we could imagine facing. And sometimes we do face them. He's not surprised because he knows that there is a day coming when he deals with death, pain, suffering, evil forever. He undoes it all. But until that day, we face trouble. We do. We will experience pain. But don't ever let that think, uh, cause you to think that God has forgotten you or he stopped loving you because no matter what happens, nothing can separate you from his love. He does walk with you through it. Just like, I mean, think of it. Jesus died on the cross to prove how much he loves us. So when we feel overwhelmed, we know we can trust God because he was willing to go through the same thing we're going through, except way worse for us. We can trust that he is good and he is in control and we can trust that he is faithful and that this right here is not the end. So we need to learn to think with the big picture in mind, the end game in mind. And again, it's not just some believe in yourself, trust in your heart kind of advice. This is about trusting what Christ has done. Don't be defined by what other people say about you or think about you or do to you. Remember this. We are called, and we've talked about this a bunch of times since uh, this summer, but we're called a kingdom of priests, a community of priests. And remember, we said a priest is somebody who unites God with those who don't know him. We are to be people who know God intimately and deeply and then who share that love and help other people know him. We are his hands and feet in the world. His kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're the instruments for that to happen. And so what I challenge you to do is begin reading the scriptures and allow God to change the way you think so that you see love for him and love for people as your primary motivations. He wants to transform you. And it's amazing. I can't even explain how it happens in the midst of loving him and loving people. That's, that is when this transformation happens. So as I close, I want to challenge you this week to do a couple of things. One, one, there it is. Read Romans, uh, well, read Romans 8 each day. The, The point of this is I want you to keep growing in your relationship with God. I want to challenge you to read Romans 8 every day this week. If you read slow, it'll take you six minutes. If you read fast, it'll take you four minutes, four minutes a day. And if you're, if you're willing to accept the challenge and read Romans 8, that chapter, each day this week, I would ask that every day you pick out an idea that's interesting to you and you reflect on that one throughout the day. Because you can look at all of the things where Paul says, you know, having said these things, all of those things are amazing. Allow that to just kind of saturate your life this week so that you can grow to be more like him and you can grow to know him and allow him to change your heart. All right, second thing. I, I would challenge you, if you're willing to take me up on number one, I mean, I, I double-dog dare you to take me up on number two, <laughs> to memorize Romans 12, 2. It's the verse that says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Probably, I would say, one of the key verses in Scripture because it changes who we are. We become like him. We become different because of the way we think. That affects what we do. So I, I just challenge you to do that. Number three, act as his, the hands and feet of Jesus. You know, until the day that everything is made right and pain and suffering are done, we are the body of Christ in the world. We are his hands and feet, his tangible presence in the world. And until that day, he desires as many people as possible to discover his love through this community, this spiritual family. The universal church, yes, but lakeside community as well. He wants to do something here. And then finally, number four, most, most important one of all, follow Jesus. Maybe you've been living a self-centered life. Maybe when you go through the struggles, it, it's hard to think about anything but yourself and your own pain, and I get it. Maybe you're, you're, your focus has been on your life and your future and the stuff you want to accomplish. But Jesus said that when we focus on that stuff, it's empty. But if you focus on him, you will find life. We only find life when we die to ourselves. 
our, our wants and our desires. And that is so upside down, but so true. So maybe you're here, um, and you know that's been you, and you've been focusing on you. And Jesus says, turn the focus back on me. Many followers of Christ struggle with this one. We love our own stuff. We love our own, you know, God, I'm going this way. Follow along, and will you bless me on the way? That's kind of our attitude. And he says, no, 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 no. I want to lead, and I want you to follow me wherever I lead. That's what a disciple is. So maybe that's some people in this room, and I challenge you to, to again, follow Jesus. But there might even be some people in this room who have never crossed the line of faith. You've never said no to yourself and said yes to Jesus. I want to follow you. So more than anything, I invite you to do that today, to make Jesus the focus of your life, to make him the one that you call Lord, to allow him to transform your thoughts, to to allow him to forgive the mess. Because there's nothing more freeing than knowing that when I came to Jesus just as I was, broken in a mess, he said, I got it. I died. Your sins are clean. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. And when you do that, he gives you a purpose that is so much bigger than you. And if you want to do that, you can tell him. In fact, uh, as we close, let's, we're going to take communion in a minute. But as we close, I want to give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. I would love for you to take communion as part of our family the first time as a follower of Jesus. And so if you'd like to follow him, uh, let's just, would you bow your head, close your eyes with me just to give everybody some privacy. If you want to follow Jesus, this prayer might give you some words. You can say, well, and, and for those of you who are followers, but you've kind of been focusing on yourself, maybe even for you, use this prayer as um, kind of a, some words to reaffirm your commitment to Jesus. But you can say, Jesus, I don't want to keep focusing on myself. That is so empty. You are the only one who can bring life. And Jesus, I need life. Today, I choose to follow you. I want to become whatever you desire. So change my heart. Help me follow you with everything in me. Help me change the way I think so that I can be somebody who overcomes through the power of your death and your resurrection. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.